The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Unlikely Innovators. Mike, how are you doing? Great episode today. It really was a great episode, Steve. Um, if you can't tell, I have uh, the International Space Station uh, above my shoulder here. It's obviously... It's a Lego model, but we brought on a, a real person who actually helped build that space station and, and commanded it, uh, Colonel Chris Hadfield. So an absolute thrill for you and I, I think, to talk to, to, talk to Chris, as we can now call him, because we've had a 45-minute chat with him. What, what, what are your takeaways? I mean, uh, like, like I said in the episode, like I wanted to ask him you know, everything about living in space, but we really had to rein that in. I'm a huge space nerd, Star Trek, Star Wars um oh, the apollo missions like i've been a huge hmm. space nerd forever so this is in many ways uh you know as good as it gets for me so that that was my takeaway yeah no i uh, just it's a little overwhelming but i think you know you you didn't want to ask him those questions but i think one of the we talked about his new book the apollo murders and it's obviously a fictional account but it's it's rooted i think in his own lived experiences and i think the experiences of those that came before him but I think in that book, I finished it. I don't. I think you're still making your way through it. But he de- he gets into a lot of the details about what it is actually like living in space, eating in space, doing all these sorts of other things that he's obviously, I think, has defined his career is is making space accessible to people, and he still continues to do that. You know, with this with his first foray into fiction, um, mm-hmm. I just couldn't I couldn't help but you know I th- I thought his advice was great about you know. What if you guys, you know, traveled in space and commanded space shuttles and, you know, all the, all these sorts of things, like what would you do with that knowledge and that lived experience? You would want to share it. Right. And I think that's so great that when you put it in that, when you put, put it in that perspective, it's just, I think he continues to try to take his, what you and I think are incredible experiences and very innovative and provide that, uh, you know, to everybody else, I think is just great and it's admirable. And again, I think he also motivated me. Uh, to dip my tone to fiction. I kind of told him that I was a little bit scared to do it because I thought I'd be bad at it. But he said, you know, you're not going to be, you're not going to be the best right out of the gate. So you just have to do it. So. Yeah. No. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it was such a pleasure to have uh, him on. And and if people do want answers to those questions about what it, what it's like to, to live in space, you could, uh, you could uh, pick up his book, the Apollo murders and and have some of those uh, very viscerally uh, told to you. Um, But what we won't do is spend any more time talking about Chris Hadfield. We're going to go talk with him. So right now we'll give you Chris Hadfield. So the show is called the unlikely innovators, but this week's guest is certainly not an unlikely innovator. Colonel Chris Hadfield is a decorated, heavily decorated astronaut, engineer, military fighter, and test pilot, and the first Canadian commander of the international space station. Colonel Hadfield has had a distinguished career, which has included flying three space space missions, building two space stations and two spacewalks. Uh, Colonel Hadfield's career has also included making space more accessible to millions, uh, which many of you have probably seen his rendition of David Bowie's Space Oddity, which has been seen by over 75 million people and counting. And if that wasn't enough, uh, Colonel Hadfield is also an internationally uh, bestselling author of four books, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. Uh, you are here, uh, the darkest dark children's book, which is a hit here in the Camino House, and more recently, the Apollo Murders, uh, his first foray into fiction, which we will talk about today. Uh, but for now, uh, Colonel Hadfield, thanks for joining us. You're on the Unlikely Innovators. Mike, Steve, not nice to be chatting with you both. Thanks. So we always ask this question to our guests when they come on, and it's you know it's always like a lot of our guests have an unlikely career path where they end up in a field that they didn't think. And, you know, when I think of when we ask this question to a lot of guests, sometimes they'll say, when I was younger, I wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up, but, but you actually did that. So could you talk a little bit about whether or not you could draw a line back to your childhood dreaming about that career or, or how did that work for you? Yeah, I think it does start with dreams, Mike. I think it's really important to have dreams. Uh, if you don't dream about what you want to happen with your life, then, then how do you know what to do next? You know, what? What, 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 are you, what are you aiming towards in life if you have no dreams? So I think dreams are important, but just as important uh, uh, as dreams uh, are actions. And what are you actually doing to make your life more like your dreams? And so uh, I decided to be an astronaut uh, when I was nine years old. <laughs> and um, sounds outrageous and, and weird, but it's true. And, um, and I was dreaming of flying in space because of science fiction and, you know, books and comic books and Star Trek and Arthur C. Clarke and 2001 A Space Odyssey and stuff like that. 
Um, but then the reality of it was people were flying in space. And then they walked on the moon when I was nine, just about to turn 10. And I just decided, hey, I'm going to grow up to be something. Why don't I grow up to be that? And, and what do I need to do? How, how do I make that happen? And so that just helped shape all the little decisions in my life ever since. Well, when you talk about unlikely professions, I never would have thought that I would be, you know, a best-selling fiction author. That, that's pretty unlikely, but hey, that happened too. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I was just going to say, like, I think in terms of obviously, when you think of an astronaut, obviously, it's a very, you know, innovative field. But I think the things that you've done, uh, you know, after your career and during your career, I think are those really unlikely innovations where, like you talked about incorporating the music or, or becoming a, a best-selling fiction author. Yeah, I, and I work in innovation as well. I work for the Creative Destruction Lab. I run one of their technical streams. It's a techno technology uh, in innovation company. So, so I work with all sorts of young inventors and, and people with new ideas and trying to turn what they're dreaming of into something that can maybe be a scalable reality. So yeah, I, I'm all, I mean, innovation, that's every single thing that's around us and the way the three of us are talking, it was just uh, an impossible idea in somebody's head at some point that they figured out a way to turn into reality. That's actually so great that you work with CDL. Um, I know a lot of our listeners actually have gone through that and we've actually featured a couple of founders that went through that really rigorous uh, program they have there. It's a great program. I think it's really putting Canada on the map of, of you know, doing things differently when it comes to, to innovation and companies. Um, and you do talk, like, so, so when you think, when people think about space and space travel and space exploration, I think they do think about that high tech, the high tech aspect, aspects of innovation, like the Canada arm, or the latest telescope, which is obviously making the news uh, recently, um, or the experiments that happen on the on the space station. But you've made space more accessible throughout your career than I think a lot of your a lot of your colleagues may have. What made you want to do that? Not focus on you know the latest nuts and bolts that we're doing in space, but also the human factor, crying in space, singing in space. What, what made you want to do that? Well, I probably spent 99% uh, of my time on the nuts and bolts because that's, you know, and, and pumps and valves because that's what keeps you alive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's what needs all the attention. Um, but I didn't want to spend just 100% of mine. I didn't want to miss the experience that I was having. So and I've kind of thought that way my whole life. Let's pay attention to what matters and get the important stuff done. But you know, don't don't miss your own life while you're so busy doing something. Um, but I think I just followed a really good example. And that was, you can compare the, uh, the Soviet program in the early 60s with the American. Uh, the Soviets never told anybody what was happening until it was done and successful. And then they would release a sanitized version of it. The Americans were like, hey, we're going to the moon and, uh, and we're gonna kill some people. We're gonna discover some stuff. We're gonna, we're, but we're just gonna put it all out there because this is life. And the impact was so much bigger. Uh, the, the number of PhDs per capita in the US in the 10 years after the Apollo program, it's never been matched per capita. And people saw themselves differently because of the fact that they were willing to share the, the depths and breadth of the human experience. It's part of the reason that I knew about it and I was attracted to it. And so I think I just resolved even back then that if I ever get to do something interesting and cool and fun, especially as a public servant, that uh, it, it would be selfish of me just to not share it in any way that I can think of. And, I, and I'm still doing that. You know, Steve had already mentioned the Canadarm. And I think for a lot of Canadians, when we think of, you know, space exploration, I think that's one that we think about. It's certainly uh, folks of uh, Steve and my vintage, like I grew up with like the Lego space shuttle set that had the Canadarm in it. So like I, I got exposed to that at, at a young age as well. I obviously didn't go on the career path that you did, but it was still, think, I think, something that you were proud of as a Canadian. But, you know, we'd mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope that is in the news now because it just passed its first, uh, you know, guidance sensor, uh, I guess, uh, evaluation to make sure that it can kind of continue. And obviously, that's all Canadian built. It's meant to be the successor to the Hubble Telescope. So that's another, you know, Canadian made innovation. When you think about, you know, the Canadian contributions to space travel and space exploration, what are some of the things that you think of? Is it the Canadarm or are there other things? How does, how do you kind of put all that together? 
Well, Canon Arm is real personal to me because I was the first Canadian to operate it uh, mm -hmm. in space, Canon Arm 1. And then I helped build Canon Arm 2 onto the International Space Station. And I was the first Canadian to use Canon Arm 2 <laughs> uh, during that flight, got to move it around. So, so yeah, the, the, I was uh, you know heavily involved with those projects along with the thousands of all the people in the companies that helped build it. You know, the little mom and pop shops across the country that made all the little bits that ended up in the Canon Arms. You know, we, we sort of forget the, the thousands of people that made their livelihood uh, making all of that space hardware. But, uh, you know, we were the third nation on earth in space. After the Soviet Union, the United States, we were next with, with Alouette and it was, uh, John Chapman, one of our early real brilliant uh, researchers and engineers and scientists uh, who kind of founded space in Canada, he, he made that happen. And, and it was a research satellite to go up and look at the upper edges of the atmosphere. Because, you know, where do the northern lights come from? And how do we communicate using the atmosphere? And what's the ionosphere and all the rest of that thermosphere? And, and so with a big northern country like Canada, that information is really important. And so... Uh, so we were, I think people forget Alouette was third, you know, uh, so we got a bronze medal for that. And, um, and then we really pioneered telecommunications as well. I think so that, you know, we could watch Montreal and uh, Vancouver play hockey together all live across the country, but um, our relay satellites, the ANIC and, and all of those that we started in the late sixties and early seventies, that was really pioneering work. And then our radar uh, sensing satellites like RadarSat, which launched in 95, where you can map the entire world, no matter what weather, all the time using synthetic, synthetic aperture radar. That, that was huge and really important. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're not the only country in space by any means, um, but we've been a leader and, and we've uh, done some really creative stuff. And we've got two Canadian astronauts right now that are going to go to the moon. You know, that's pretty cool. Part of a big international organization, and, and that makes sense. It doesn't really uh, be logical for Canada to try and do it all by itself, but it does make sense to do it cooperatively. So I'm not sure which of our current astronauts are going to be the ones, but we've got two slots going to the moon, and that's that's a pretty interesting next step you know, amongst the thousands and thousands of steps that have gone before. I'm proud of all of it. Yeah, and I think I hadn't planned to ask this, uh, but I wanted to just, could you shed a bit of light on that unlikely journey? Because it's not a fait accompli that every person that joins the space program as an astronaut goes to space. Is that correct? Yeah, well, it's, you know, that, that is true. The, this filter to get selected as an astronaut is really, really tight. Like, you have thousands, of, I think, in this current European selection that's going on, I forget the number, 25,000 people or something applied, um, and they're going to hire a handful, you know, so, so they get to choose not just physically healthy, but incredibly capable and accomplished people. And um, so when you've gone through that process, and then you bring them in the door, you want them to succeed, and then you're going to train them a really esoteric set of skills, which takes a lot of time and money. And so you really want to fly them in space if you can, just to get, you know, your money back. Um, but if you're going to be on a spaceship a long way from home, uh, you have to be really healthy. You know, you, you don't want to have some problem that you have to have to go see a doctor for because there isn't one. So uh, there have been lots of astronauts have, even though they might have been able to fly in space, they've been disqualified partly through their astronaut career uh, because of a medical problem that wasn't detected during selection. Maybe the most famous was one of the very first astronauts, Deke Slayton. You know, he was selected in the first American astronaut class, and then he developed uh, some sort of small heart murmur or something, and they wouldn't let him fly until finally, over a decade later, it cleared, or they understood it well enough that he did have a chance to fly in space once. But in my selected class, they chose four of us out of 5,300, and uh, one of us uh, eventually got medically disqualified and never had Mike never had a chance to uh, to fly in space. So yeah, it happens. But um, the majority of people, once they've made it through selection, hopefully will at least get one chance to fly in space. So you said four out of fifty three hundred. Is that the the figure for your class? I think we were yeah five thousand. I forget some, something like fifty three. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I didn't count. I don't know, but uh, some number like that. And uh, the numbers are bigger. NASA's recent recruitment. I know there were 
well over 10,000, the one before that 18,000. So yeah, there's lots of people apply, um, but uh, it, it's kind of a, a nice richness to have to be able to choose. Because for me, it was a 21 year career uh, where you have to stay supremely healthy and hugely hardworking and motivated and, and most of your time away from home for decades uh, in getting ready to do a job that will have will kill some of your friends. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a very unusual profession uh, to be a professional astronaut. But uh, but the coolest thing that I could imagine. <laughs> yeah, and I could I should tell you that my uh, thirteen year old self is just wanting to ask you all the most mundane questions you've probably gotten over <laughs> and over again about life in space. So I will resist that temptation. Um, we've seen from talking to you already and what we already know that you know being an astronaut is already a very innovative. Uh, calling generally, um, and we talked about this a little bit, but but you've sort of um, gone pushing those boundaries after you've sort of ended your active astronaut career into some other initiatives. Um, talk about what you've been doing since you don't go into space, as crazy as it sounds. Well, I, I think it's maybe also worth mentioning, Steve, that uh, when I was an astronaut, then I had to train, for example, to be an IMAX cameraman. Right. You know, you may not think about that, but that's a profession, <laughs> you know, but in order to make those IMAX movies like uh, Mission to Mir or Space Station 3D or whatever, the crews had to train to be a sound guy or, or a, you know, to make all that equipment work or, or, you know, for my third flight, in order to be the pilot of a Russian Soyuz, I had to learn to speak Russian and then study orbital mechanics and control theory in Russian and then fly a spaceship. So, you know, that's quite a weird uh, level of innovation necessary just to fit within the auspices of what people sort of brush away as, oh yeah, astronaut stuff. You know, it, it's, it's pretty far reaching. The number, and, you know, I trained as an emergency medical technician and then I worked in a hospital uh, in the emergency room and in the operating room and, you know, all of the various wards just to try and get enough skills that, that I could be useful as a crew member on board a spaceship. So, so it wasn't like I, I was just doing this narrow little thing and then, then suddenly I could you know, pursue other interests. Um, but since then, you know, in the last many years of my work as an astronaut, my wife and I talked about what is it that gives us joy in life? What do we feel proud of? What makes us feel satisfied? You know, what, what at the end of the year, when you look back, what were the things that really counted this year. We kind of made up a list. And from that, we then decided, let's try and put as much of that into our lives as possible for you know, the next 40, 50 years or whatever we're going to get. And, and so that is what has really been the, uh, I don't know, the menu that we've been pulling from ever since then. And most of those things have worked out, you know, um, sharing the ideas and, and writing and, uh, you know, teaching at university and being involved with a bunch of different businesses, consulting into that and, uh, and, and all of the projects, the, the philanthropic stuff that I do and the business stuff that I do, um, all, all of that was basically purposeful um, and innovated, you know, made up from a list of things that didn't used to exist uh, and trying to turn them into a new reality, which I think is the very essence of innovation. And I, Chris, I couldn't help but as you kind of talked about, you know, being an IMAX camera operator and learning Russian and, you know, tr reading Russian manuals to train to be able to operate the equipment working in a hospital. You know, I, I couldn't help but when we, we talked to Peter Mansbridge a few episodes back after reading his book and you read his book and you see all of these like incredible things that he's done throughout his career. And to him, it's, it was just his career. He just happened to be in the right place at the right time for, I think, some of the most seismic moments in human history. But when you kind of take stock of all of these things that you've done, and I think you can see the smiles on our faces as you kind of go through it, but like, do you ever take a step back and say like, wow, like that is really cool that I've, I've been able to do all of this? Or how, or how do you kind of compartmentalize some of the things that you've done throughout your career that are, again, all very innovative in their own right, but it, you've done all of them, right? Yeah, I mean, it, there's lots of reasons for a secret smile, right? Because because <laughs> if you take moments to look back and go, wow, you know, I got to, um, you know, I got an email from the Queen and she invited my wife and I for a sleepover at Windsor Castle, you know, <laughs> and 
and we, you know, we had a nice, really nice evening and night in Windsor Castle with the Queen and Prince Philip and their corgis and, and uh, you know, and, and something like that happens in your life and it's delightful and you're respectful and, and pretty amazing. And then when it's over, you go, wow, that was, that was unexpected and fascinating. And, and I'm going to think about that for a while. I sort of feel like that about my whole life. That was unexpected and fascinating. And I want to think about that for a while. Um, but I don't spend a lot of time looking backwards because, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, literally you bump into the future if you do that. So, so I spend most of my time forward facing. I think it's more interesting. The stuff I've done already, it's cool, interesting, mm -hmm. fun. Um, but you know, it's, it, it's, it's, what's already happened. I can't do anything about it, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to spend my entire life at a high school reunion. You know, it's like, <laughs> hey, high school is great, but that that happened already. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of other schools out there and a lot of other interesting stuff. And uh, and in order to really um, get the most out of life, then you have to get involved in all of that interesting stuff. And that means you're going to have to change who you are a little bit, increase your own capacity, um, learn things keep an open mind, recognize that you change and things change and, and, and you try and marry those two things up. And the pace of invention is accelerating, you know, as we communicate so much better and have so much better tools at our fingertips and things will never be this slow again, you know? And, and so, so I think about that as well. And, and it, 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 I find it delightful. You know, uh, there's just so much choice and opportunity. Uh, and yeah, there's there's bad stuff happens every day. Some people seem to think that's what they should spend all their time in is the bad stuff. And, and you know, there, there's a lot of dog crap in the world, but I don't roll in it all the time. <laughs> you know, I recognize, yeah, there's a lot of dog crap in the world, but I'm, I'm going to, you know, step around it and help clean it up. But I'm not going to make it the purpose of my life. I think there's a lot more interesting things to do than just the negativity. And I try where possible, you know, contribute to the stuff that is positive as I define it. That's, I think that's really good perspective uh, for sure that I hope uh, all our listeners I'm sure could take away from, but you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because obviously we talked about how unlikely it is, you know, I think to go into space. And I think over the last couple of years, we've seen more talk about space tourism. And, and last year you were appointed to the space advisory board for Virgin Galactic. Um, how far away do you think we are from having, you know, space tourism being become something that is accessible, you know, to, to everyday folks, or are we going to see that in our lifetime? Well, there's some pretty everyday folks that have already flown in space. Um, but it, it's sort of like flying commercially in 1919. It was possible, but it was very dangerous and rare and therefore very expensive. And only the very wealthy could do it. And maybe they would, through their largesse, you know, fly somebody who, who wasn't wealthy. And that's sort of the stage we're at in space travel right now. So, you know, when I was born, no one had flown in space. Space travel is younger than I am. It's still a, a pretty new thing for mm -hmm. humanity. And the oldest person in the world right now is 119. That means they were born in 1903. That's when the Wright brothers flew. So there are still people alive where flight is younger than them. So you know, we sort of uh, have this weird, myopic, self-important uh, distortion of time and the pace of change. Um, but uh, the, it has never been easier to get to space, never safer and never less expensive. So that's an interesting trend. And the vehicles that we're working on right now, when I say we, I mean humanity, um, are, are making it safer and cheaper uh, and lower impact you know, from an environmental point of view, a 100% reusable spaceship. That's amazing that we can get to that stage now. We couldn't have done it 10 years ago. You know, our our computers weren't small enough and our, our modeling wasn't quick enough and our, you know, we just didn't know. But we're at the point now historically where we can do that. And, um, and the cost is down low enough now that it's gonna open up space in a way that we've never seen before. But obviously we already have an earth an earth orbit economic system, you know, with, with huge business going on uh, with satellites providing necessary functions for society. So there's a big earth space economic system and pretty shortly we'll have an earth moon economic system. We, we, people just sort of, people can see the past but it, it's kind of hard sometimes to see the pace of advance of the future. But that, that's where we're headed. 
and and a little tiny piece of all that will be space tourism. It's the one that gets the headlines. Mm -hmm. You know, what's more of a lightning rod than than a uh, a weird billionaire? You know, <laughs> everyone wants to talk about them. Number one, they've made a whole bunch of money, which lots of people are envious of. Number two, they're weird people. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done those amazing things. If they were average people, they never would have done it. So if you look at Jeff Bezos, or Elon Musk, or Richard Branson, those are really unusual folks. One is, you know, dyslexic. One has Asperger's. They're not, you know, they're not, uh, I don't know if there is such a thing as an average, but they're unusual people with a tremendous work ethic and an amazing amount of drive. And they got some serious flaws, all of them, just like everybody. But at the same time, they, they are pushing and enabling a technology that is opening up huge opportunity. And, and everyone just focuses on the little noisy uh, little bit of, uh, of, you know, tourism, but it's the rest of it that is really impactful. Yeah, and I think like with the, the center that Mike and I run, uh, the Center for Smart Mining, we constantly think about sort of terrestrial mining, right? You know, how do we get more rocks out of the ground that we need to, to exploit to make things? Do you think, like I've gone to a few seminars on space mining, you know, mining asteroids, mining the moon, those kinds of things. Do you think that's something that would be a reality? I mean, that's probably a bigger slice in the tourism piece, right? If we're, if we're thinking about what's what's available in space. Sure, we've, we've already mined the moon, right? At a very, very low level. We, we brought back hundreds of kilograms of rock. Uh, we went somewhere else, collected the rock and brought it back. So and very, very minuscule mining, um, but nothing like what you're talking. But, uh, you know, what limits mining, as you know far better than I do, is just access to the ore or whatever it is you're trying to mine. How can you economically get to the thing that you want, whether it's gold or, or rare earth elements or whatever it is? And uh, there's huge areas in Canada that have great mineral wealth um, that would serve uh, a, a strong societal function that we are unable to access right here, right here on the surface of the earth for whatever reason, whether, whether it's uh, just because of its physical location and its inaccessibility to power and heavy equipment or whatever, or because of you know, political pressure or because it's on someone's private land or whatever. There's, there's lots of rules and lots of reasons, um, but it's the same problem on the moon, access. You know, it's super crazy expensive to get to the moon. So what are you going to mine on the moon that's worth it? You know, um, uh, but if you drop the cost radically, like the new spaceships, if it's like a thousand or 10,000 times cheaper to get there, then it becomes maybe more credible for something that is a high, uh, high value and isn't that hard to mine. Um, but obviously, the, the moon, if we start living there, if we start settling there, like when we were only living in other places, when there was nobody in the Americas, you know, 30,000 years ago, um, nobody was mining here. And then uh, the first peoples came, whatever, 20,000 years ago after the ice receded and to a very small degree they mined. And then European technology showed up 500 years ago, but they didn't really start mining in earnest until they moved here and started settling here so that all of that stuff didn't have to cross the Atlantic every time you wanted to do something. We're sort of that way with the moon. Right now we got to cross something way harder than the Atlantic every single time. Makes it impractical. But the moon has about 400 billion liters of water on the surface, which is enough water to sustain a pretty good sized community. And at the poles, they have eternal power. The sun, it's perfectly upright in the solar system. So this, there's never shade. So if you have eternal solar power and you have water, then you just need the right habitat and you can live there. You can definitely put robots there. So, uh, so that makes it again more feasible. If people start settling impermanently and then permanently on the moon, then they'll locally mine just like we do on earth. So yeah, we'll get there. But, uh, but it's all, it's just a real question of, of uh, economic practical feasibility. Uh, and we're still really just, we've just literally just barely scratched the surface. Yeah. And I think as someone who watched Armageddon with uh, uh, the movie Armageddon with a, with a, you know, a terrified eye as a, as a teenager, I don't want to bring those big rocks closer to earth unless we know we can slow them down on time. Right. Um, <laughs> that, that was not a documentary. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank God. Right. Um, 
Uh, just uh, another sort of technical question, and then we'll have a bit more fun and talk about uh, your new book. Um, we, we saw you recently on CNN talk about how the ISS is going to be decommissioned soon and how they're going to be crashing that in the, uh, the Pacific Ocean um, as a means of bringing it to end of life. Um, can you talk a bit about that plan? Because I know you have some involvement there and, you know, the, the future sort of clever cleanup efforts uh, that will be associated with that. Sure. Well, the first thing is no one knows when the end of the International Space Station is going to be. Uh, it, it, everyone keeps latching on to the latest internationally agreed date that we're working towards. But the, 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 the one before this was 2024. And before that, I think it was 2020. And before that, it was 2015. Like you always need, each new government needs to come in and say, okay, what's our long-term plan for how we're going to support whatever big international project? And then you set some date. So it's not like we're going to hit 20 a day in 2030 and then suddenly the space station is going to be done. You know, it's that, that it's just the current the current U.S. political administration made an agreement uh, that they're you know going to support the space station until at least 2030, which is good because it, you know, it gives a long term funding. And if you're a scientist, you know, you've got at least eight more years to try and get your experiment done up there. So so that's smart. But eventually, um, yeah, the space station, it's a machine. Machines break. Eventually, we'll have to do something with it. You don't want to just leave it random in orbit because its orbit decays every day. It slowly will fall to Earth because there's a little bit of drag up there. If you were to measure it, it's like the weight of a penny on the front of the station, slowing it down. So every little while we fire the engines and boost it up. But if you don't do anything over years, its orbit will decay faster and faster and it would hit the world somewhere randomly and it might hit Sudbury. And you know, Sudbury's been hit before, but uh, <laughs> that was a lot of years ago. Um, but uh, that's what happened with the first American space station with Skylab. They, they intended the space shuttle to go up and get it, but the space shuttle was delayed so and Skylab had no engines, so it just decayed and it ended up crashing back to the world and parts of it hit Australia. Fortunately, it didn't hurt anybody. Um, space, International Space Station is way bigger. So you wanna have a plan. And so the anything you launch into space, you need a complete life cycle plan. You know, and how are you gonna get rid of the junk? How are you gonna deorbit it? We, we should have been doing that since the beginning, but we, you know, we're not perfect. We weren't, it's left us with a mess to clean up. But uh, space stations specifically, you need a plan. And all you do is you just uh, use the engines at the end of life to drive it down into the air where the air will slow it down so that it'll mostly just burn up like a meteorite and just turn to tiny fine particles of dust. Just like the 40 tons of rock of meteorites that hit the world every day, 40 tons a day. You know, when you see one of those slanting sunbeams and there's like those little dust motes falling down, those are extraterrestrials. You know, that's, that's dust from satellites or, or from meteorites. Um, so most of the space station will just burn up, but it's got some dense sections and some heavy sections and some of it will make it all the way to the surface. And so you don't wanna drive it into the world where it might hurt somebody or something. And if you just spin a globe, where's the biggest, emptiest, open, uninhabited spot? It's the South Pacific. So that's where we drive our spaceships. It's I helped build the space station Mir, the Russian space station. Uh, and when it reached the end of its life, that's where we drove it. And that's what we'll do with the International Space Station eventually. But, you know, that's still a decade away. And there's uh, 16 orbits a day, you know, 365 days a year. There's a lot of distance to cover between now and then. Yeah, no, no kidding. Um, one of the things, you know, we alluded to this at the beginning that we want to talk about your new book. Uh, I have it here, The Apollo Mirrors. I read it over the weekend. It's great. Um, and, you know, you talked about when you were young, you, you, when you were a kid, you were influenced by science fiction that ultimately, you know, set up your career path. So maybe you wanting to write a science fiction novel isn't that unlikely because, you know, that's what you would have been consuming as a child. But I want to ask you, um, what made you want to get into this and write and write a science fiction novel? Well, I think sharing ideas is fun. You know, uh, I'm not a hermit. And I think one of the coolest things is to come up with a new idea and then share it with other people. I mean, what's a painting? It, it's, 
It's a new idea that you've used your particular talents to try and share an idea with somebody else, right? Uh, what's what's supper? What is anything? You know, it's you're you're creating something new with through your own capabilities. And if if you two guys had flown three different rocket ships and commanded a spaceship and been around the world, you know, 2,600 times, what would you do with that experience? It, it's worth asking yourself. What would I do with that? You just you just tell your your kids, you know, what do you do? And and I wasn't there for just my benefit. I was there on behalf of millions of Canadians. And I don't want to just squander it and keep it to myself. That would be selfish and and I don't think right. So I think sharing the ideas that come from it are are worth it. And that's why I've written those other books. But there's there, in writing fiction, like in the Apollo murders, it gives you a lot more freedom to tell a more complete story. You know, uh, you know, math is interesting and graphs are interesting, but humans are really complicated and, and, and human interaction and what actually goes on on a, a mission preparation and, and a space flight inside a spaceship with, with all the different personalities you have there. And so by writing a fictional version, even though it's um, historical thriller fiction, it's very much steeped in reality because it's, it's historic. Um, but it still gave me a lot more latitude to let people in on what it's actually like to fly in space. And, and what's really involved and, you know, what astronauts value and how do we react to each other when things go great and when things go terrible. And, and I, I, I discovered that I enjoy it too. It's fun writing and, and pushing myself that way. And so uh, that helped me get the Apollo murders done. And, uh, and I'm writing the next book in the series now. Oh, great. <laughs> Looking forward to that one. But I, I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because again, I Steve always hates this when I bring this up on the podcast, especially with esteemed guests, but I do some writing of my own on the side. It's 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 mostly nonfiction. And I'm always scared of writing fiction because I feel like I wouldn't be good at it because it's just I've, I've never done it before. And I feel like with fiction, you can tell who's doing a good job at it and who's not doing a good job at it. There's nowhere to really hide the way that you could sometimes with nonfiction, but admittedly there's a lot of bad nonfiction out there as well. But the rambling question I have for you is you, you said you like the challenge and obviously I think you get a little bit more latitude in able to tell the story. Um, was, was there any like learning curve or any challenges you had making the jump to fiction uh, that you hadn't had with any of your previous books? It's not a jump to fiction. It's a decade long agonized climb. <laughs> To fiction. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not like I just went, hey, I think I'll write a book and you know, <laughs> 10 minutes later, I'm not, I'm not unbewitched or something, you know. And so I said, I, I, you know, at one point in my life, I wanted to learn to fly airplanes or learn to be a scuba diver or learn to ride a bike or learn to speak Russian or whatever, and, you know, or learn to write fiction. It's the same. You, you have a certain amount of raw ability and then you give yourself uh, an impossible, a currently impossible task like I'm four years old and I want to ride a two-wheeler. And then you get people to explain it to you or you watch other people doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and then you watch somebody who does it really well and you see what's possible here and then you study it. And then, and then you give it a try and you're terrible at it. And, and then you go, huh. And I think it was Ray Bradbury who said, uh, if you want to be a writer, um, remember that nobody can write 500 bad short stories. You know, by, by the time you get to the 400th one, you're going to start to get the hang of it and you're going to realize what doesn't work and what does. And um, and so I, you know, I, I took uh, James Patterson's masterclass and I read Stephen King's book on writing and I read the, the thriller fiction authors that I think are the best in the genre. And I read them really clinically. How do they punctuate? How do they... Uh, how do they attribute sentences? How, how do they start each paragraph? How do they start a chapter? How do they end a chapter? How do they make you want to go to the next chapter? Those are all just writing techniques. It's just like riding a bike, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so learn all those tactics and then start doing it and just start writing. And, and you may find out that you're a lousy bike rider or whatever, a lousy, whatever it is. And then go, okay, cool. I'm not gonna be the best in the world at this. I'm not the worst in the world, but I'm just, you know, I think about a million books get published every year, about a million. So, you know, 
give yourself some slack, you know, <laughs> to try and be number one is probably not going to happen. Just, you know, hopefully you're not the millionth, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but the, the important thing is that you're writing a book and, and, and get at it, get done. I, I was lucky enough in space to have a, a, a long talk with Neil Young of all people. Uh, we were talking, he, he was calling from his, uh, the best internet in his house was in, oddly enough, he, uh, he has a, um, a hybrid 1959 Lincoln Continental. And that was the best Wi-Fi in his house. So he was sitting in the back of his Lincoln talking to me. And he said two things to me. He said um, uh, he'd never written a song in his life. He just wrote songs down. And that sounds a little trite, but it's worth thinking about. He didn't say to himself, I'm writing a novel. Instead, he said, uh, I just wrote a sentence. I, just, I wasn't trying to write the greatest song in the world. I was just writing songs down. I was just writing down what occurred to me. And the second thing he said was, don't judge your work of art until you're done. Because if you start judging it partway through, if you put two brush strokes on a canvas and then go, oh, that's terrible, <laughs> then how do you know? And you're not going to get any better at it. And you're never going to get one done. Get a painting done. And it won't be the Mona Lisa. But you know, do it and, and then do another one. And, and so I really took Neil's words to heart and, and worked at it. And uh, the book that you held up, I think, uh, that's popular in your house, The Darkest Dark, um, that was the fourth kid's book that I wrote. But it's the first one we published because it was the only one I thought that, okay, I'm, I'm to the point now that I think I understand this better. And this book is going to be worth actually putting the effort into publishing, you know. So, so it's a learning process. And, and I've written a lot of songs that nobody else has ever heard. And that's fine. You know, mo almost everything you do is personal. And then once in a while, maybe something that you do, somebody else will appreciate too. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's gravy. I just want those uh, keeping score at home to realize that you said very nonchalantly that, oh, you know, I was talking to Neil Young from the space station. That's, uh, that's not a trivial statement by any means. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's sort of like, you know, it's just, it happened, you know, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's a cool, fun, interesting thing, you know, yeah. and, uh, but the, the cool part of it was we actually had a, a real conversation, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't, nobody was listening, but the two of us, it wasn't a media thing. Wow. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, a real nice privilege to be able to get to know Neil even a little bit. Yeah, and I just want to pick up on that. Uh, we're coming to the end of our time together. But um, one thing that Mike and I um, sort of notice as we have these incredible innovators on is there's always like a thread of musical talent uh, through each of them. Um, and that's certainly the case with you as well. And I just, can you talk, have you ever thought of an explanation for why that might be the, the link between innovation and, and musical talent? It seems to be uh, synonymous in some cases. I've, I've run into musicians my whole life who, who it is not their profession, that's for sure. Uh, I've been in an all astronaut band for 30 years and I mean, we're not the best band in the world, but we're all right, you know. Um, uh, I think uh, the complexity of the human brain uh, is unfathomable and, and the, the potential for creativity that can come out of us, you know, um, you can talk to a three-year-old and they are going to come up with ideas that you would never come up with. It's an amazing uh, thing, our, our ability to create. And so I think um, the whole idea of innovation is, is purely imagining something that doesn't exist yet and then finding a way to start to make it real. And, and music is that, essentially. You're, you're taking... Uh, some human invention, whether it's a, a flute or a trombone or a guitar, um, and, and your own, you know, ability to blow air across your vibrating fleshy bits in your throat and, and shape it and somehow create uh, something that will emotionally move other people. You know, that's, that's pretty cool and pretty amazing, and, but it all comes out of our head. And, uh, and so I think it's just a, a, an absolutely necessary form of human expression. Um, there, if, you, if you're on the Rhine River down in the south towards the Austrian border and you climb a hill, there's a cave up on one of the hills above the Rhine where they were digging in there and they found um, 
uh, from 42,000 years ago, a musical instrument. And it's a, it's a hollow leg, or it's the leg of a bird, which are hollow. Uh, I think it's a vulture or a crane or something. Um, but someone, I'm sure when they were you know uh, eating, they grabbed one of these and blew on one in and it made a whistling noise. But someone, punt, they drilled holes in it so that when you cover them with your fingers, it changes the resonating column. And what's amazing is it is that same do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do scale that we take for granted. So you could, I, I could walk with my six string into that cave and within five minutes, we'd be laughing and playing harmony together. And so music is ancient and very human and very fundamental. And, uh, and so I think it's pretty common and it's a great way to express your own creativity and innovation. And Chris, you mentioned an all astronaut band. I just wanted to say that Sebri has a band called the Shaft Bottom Boys and they play mining events and they wear mining gear. So again, you've got the all astronaut band and then you've got the mining band in Sebri. It's fitting. Um, but you've been so generous with your time, but we wanted to ask you one last question, have a little bit of fun. Um, I couldn't help when I was reading the Apollo murders that I could see this as being a great fit for the silver screen because you've got obviously the space travel, you've got like the Cold War thriller um, and obviously it's, you've got some historical figures in there that are, that are real. So I think it would make for a good ad adaptation. I think we've seen already that Armageddon is not a movie that gets space travel, right? But in your mind, which movie do you think, uh, gets the space experience most accurate? Apollo 13, I think is, uh, the best Ron Howard made that movie and worked really hard because it's, it's based on real events. Um, to make it as credible and factual as he possibly could. And he spent a bunch of time with us uh, down in Houston. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, he actually filmed those weightless sequences in the back of one of the airplanes that goes up and down. So he could make everything actually weightless for, you know, 20 seconds and, and film uh, Tom Hanks and company doing their stuff. Um, so I think Apollo 13 is probably about as good as it gets. But for interest's sake, uh, the Apollo Murders, my, my uh, thriller novel, uh, we were just signed with a, a production house uh, in the UK to bring it to the screen. So we're just in the brand new early stages of that. But that's kind of the next big project is to um, is to take my book and uh, and turn it into, uh, you know, sort of a Netflix kind of thing. So so I, I'm just starting to learn how to do that. But th I think that's going to be a lot of fun. But I, I want it to be a lot closer to Apollo 13 than I do to Armageddon. Yeah. It's going to have my name on it. So I don't want to be, you know, cringing when it's on the screen. We need, we need to make it um, as interesting and, and also as correct as, uh, as the book is. That's great. Colonel, uh, thanks so much for spending some time with us. Uh, I think we had a great time. I think uh, maybe the next time we talk to you, it'll be right after uh, you won a Golden Globe for the the <laughs> adaptation, the original screenplay or something like that. But it was just a, a true uh, pleasure and honor to talk to you. And then thanks for taking time to, uh, to stop by the Unlikely Innovators today. Steve and Mike, thank you very much. And uh, I hope uh, my band from way up high gets to play with your band from way down low at one point. <laughs> awesome. Super. We'd love thanks that. So much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Well, Steve, I guess this is our re-entry segment of the episode. <laughs> We've survived our, our return to Earth, uh, and we're now better for it, having just had a great conversation with, uh, with Colonel Chris Hadfield. We didn't burn up on re-entry. We, we did not. I think the thing that, you know, and again, now that this is a video podcast, the viewers would have seen your emphatic two thumbs up when he said that Apollo 13 is probably the best, uh, captures the best, uh, sorry, captures the experience in space most accurately. Yeah. And I was, in my mind, big thumbs up as well, because I think that was a, a seminal movie for us when we were growing up. For sure. Um, certainly, I think, I forget how old I would, must have been when it first came out, but it was at an age when I was still very much interested in, in space travel and all, all these sorts of things. And so for me, I'm glad that he, he threw that one out there because that's a movie that means a lot to me. I've watched it a number of times over the years while I build my, uh, my space exploration Lego sets. Uh, it's clear that Armageddon is not <laughs> the most accurately told, uh, you know, adaptation of space travel, but I think we already knew that. Yeah, and I think, <laughs> um, so Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, gave this movie a lot of hell, but also if you want like the sort of claustrophobic nature of space travel, I also thought Gravity was uh, with Sandra Bullock and uh, 
and George Clooney was also a very impactful film that way. They may not get all the, you know, the technical pieces exactly right, but uh, it, it made you feel what it's like in space, not just what it looks like in, in space. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a close second, at least for me. But what the hell do I know? We had an astronaut on today that said Apollo 13 takes the cake. So I'll take his word for it. Yeah. And I mean, I guess maybe I don't know if it's breaking news, but uh, again, it sounds like the film is, uh, is, is has been optioned. So again, um, you couldn't help but tell when you're reading it that this is obviously, I think, tailor made for the silver screen. It's been a while since we've had, uh, I don't know if we've ever had like a Cold War espionage space thriller. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. And I think it was interesting, don't you find, when he was talking about the book, uh, how, you know, when he talks about writing fiction, um, Stephen King comes up because I think there's a bit of a parallel, at least in the style of how I was when I was reading it uh with 11 1963 uh yeah. by 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 stephen king because it's taking again the same era real historical people and then intermixing fictional people that are engaging with these real people um so maybe maybe there's some cross-pollination there yeah no i i know the book that he referenced too i think it's on on the art of the craft mm -hmm. um and it's it's basically like a you know from from the master himself i haven't read it i have it on my shelf it's kind of one of those things where like every time <laughs> I want to I want to read a new I want to I want to read that book I end up looking at the stack of books I've just ordered and I have <laughs> to make my way through those first but but I mean it's yeah it was such a great chat I mean the the hilarious part and I, we kind of alluded to this when he kind of gave a rundown of all of the things that he's done throughout his career being trained as an IMAX you know cameraman in space having to learn Russian working in a hospital we didn't even talk to him about like being a military fighter pilot and a test right. pilot um again just another just an incredibly lived life and again he's obviously still a lot of life to live so who knows what he'll add to those chapters in the coming years but uh looking forward to seeing what he does because it will certainly be innovative if nothing else yeah and i think uh just one other thing that i thought was a bit cute was he talks about how he built the the mir space station or helped build mir the same way my dad would mention to me that he just changed the spark plugs in his car. Right. Yeah. So there's that interesting thing. It becomes run of the mill for someone like him, but it's like you and I are sitting there gobsmacked, you know, that that's something he worked on, right. That you could see in the night sky uh, on a clear day uh, with the naked eye <laughs> blinking at you. Right. Yeah, I think I'm a hero when I get the snowblower running for the first time every winter. Meanwhile, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. so, but anyway, it was, it was, it was a great chat. Again, I think we learned a lot. Uh, and again, I certainly have some takeaways that I think I'm going to apply to my own life. Um, I love that line he had about there's, there's plenty of dog crap in the world, but I don't roll in it every day. So yeah, yeah. again, if nothing else, I'm sure there's a lot of other takeaways from the show, but I think, I think our listeners will find something else, th something that speaks to them uh, uniquely and, and hopefully they can apply that to their lives. Yeah, so I guess we did. We failed to to refer to the opening as our our pre launch sequence, but this is now, uh, I think, mission accomplished. Uh, we're we're now uh, on Earth, and that's the end of the episode. Yeah, I mean, I think it just doesn't do it doesn't do the time it takes to launch into space justice. As I'm reading this book, and they go into the shuttle, it's like then they have to wait three hours. <laughs> I just kept thinking about the time of like it takes so long to to do all this. Of course, because they're in space. Um, yeah. or that the spacewalks take like when they were on the moon, you'll be out there for five hours. It's like that's that's a long time to be out walking around on the moon. But anyway, I digress. We've already tried to close the episode. I think I'm just uh still just yeah. giddy from that conversation. But anyway, uh thanks for joining us. Now we've got to top this one. So tune in next week for another episode of The Unlikely Innovators. Bye bye. The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel, presented by Cambrian RD and the Center for Smart Mining.